All right, how's it going everyone? Um, today we are going to be talking about depth perception, um, how we perceive depth. Um, and one thing that we really need to recognize with depth perception is that this is a function of the brain, not of the eyes. The eyes see the world in two dimensions and the brain processes that and allows us to see depth and recognize that something that um, something that is closer or farther away. So uh, you have the window that's behind me. Um, one of the ways that your brain knows that that, you know we're not on the same field is from the brain and it's processing that information so that's what we're going to be talking about uh, for this lecture so let's get after it so starting with, um, this is just an experiment that you need to know about it is known as the visual cliff uh, so it is this uh, experiment that they did um, in like the 1960s and basically what they were trying to do um, was they were trying to see at what age do we actually gain depth perception about how old are we when this at first happens and uh, generally speaking we pick this information up at like the six month mark uh, sometimes a little bit beforehand um, as the uh, you know children basically as you can see in the picture um, what's happening is they have this full play uh, this uh, sheet class that would go all the way across the table and they would literally try to coax the child to come and crawl off uh, the ledge um, which wasn't a ledge it was you know they were perfectly safe inside on this table um, but it would look like if the baby would look down and so they were trying to see it like you know what age were they you know recognizing oh there's like a there's like a drop off here um so uh literally you just need to know about this experiment and that it, that it exists and is known as the visual cliff Okay, so next we need to talk about how, you know, like the different modes or the different ways that our brain picks up information uh, about depth. And it does it in two, two of these different ways. We have binocular and monocular cues. So binocular, two eyes. So basically binocular cues is how the brain sees depth based on the use of both of our eyes. When How, how does it use the information that both of ours our eyes are getting at the same time in order to recognize depth okay so retinal disparity is the major way in which this happens okay so as it says a binocular cue for perceiving depth by comparing images from the retinas and the two eyes the brain computes the distance the greater the difference between the two images the closer the object okay fancy way of saying this when you are looking out at something so right now your my camera is slightly to my right okay and so what my brain is doing is i like use both of my eyes to look that direction what my brain is doing is it is getting a picture from both my eyeballs both my eyes are focused in on the camera but both my eyes send different images to the brain and one of the things that brain recognizes is that my right eye is slightly closer than the image my left eye is giving it picks up on that nuance difference okay and so one of the ways that the brain recognizes depth is by comparing the picture in this eye to the picture in this eye and when it realizes oh it's a little bit closer to this eye than it is this one that helps us recognize that depth okay so one of the silly things that you can do is you can take two fingers hold them about maybe not even an inch apart less than that and look past them look in between that space and look past them and what you'll see is you'll see like these little sausage finger things it's really kind of weird so you'll have your left finger your right finger and then in between you'll have like these little like oh i didn't draw this wide enough but you'll have this like little sauce floating sausage finger in the middle it'll look like that and you can kind of move it a little bit farther away you can move them closer together it looks like they're touching it's very strange um but that that'll that is showing you the you know what that is showing you is that your brain is really kind of a little confused trying to figure out how both of these are um working so okay so now let's move on to monocular cues okay so all of these are ways in which our brain processes depth but you only need one eye in order to do this you can still you can still sense and understand depth 
even if you've got one eye. So when you're do so when I'm going through all these examples, all you gotta do cover one eye, and that will help you, and you'll just be able to see it. It'll, it'll make sense. Okay. So depth cues, once again, how your brain processes information. You only need one eye in order to do this. Okay. So first one, relative height. Once again, you can just close this one eye. Easy peasy. All right. So the question is, which is closer, these pelicans or these buildings? Okay. Obviously, you know, not even not even a question. Pelicans are obviously closer. Okay, one of the ways that we can tell this is when you are looking at your field of vision. Okay, when you are looking at everything in your field of vision, things that are lower to you are closer. Things that are higher to you are farther away. This can almost be considered a diag, you know, diagonal lines, or right. So like on a slope. Okay. And these pelicans are just lower, like the bottom of the top of this pelican doesn't even reach the bottom of these buildings. And, you know, that's, you know, we know that that's a flat surface. This is water here. We know that this is flat. So that is one of the ways that our brain tells us, okay, something is really far away. Now this picture on the right hand side, I don't have a measuring stick to show you, but this is playing on your sense of relative height. This little guy right here and this guy up here are the exact same size. So if you take some sort of like ruler or pen or pencil and you just place it up on the thing, you will see that these two are the exact same height. It just so happens that they that because one is pushed up higher, like one is like tucked in the corner on the bottom, the other is like pushed higher in our field of vision with the top enclosed, it makes the back one look much larger, but they're really the same size, okay? So next we have relative size, okay? If we know the size of two objects, um, the one that's closer will look bigger, okay? So here in this picture, look at this, we have, um, you know, all these giant air balloons. These giant air balloons are probably going to be very similar in size. And so we know that this one is farther away than this one because this one is way smaller. You can see this one with one eye. In the picture beforehand, one of the ways that we know that the buildings are so far away is that the pelicans are decently close in size. Or, you know, I mean, not super close, but we know pelicans are really small in comparison to buildings. So those buildings are, must be so far away if they are, you know, if the building is only three times bigger than the pelican. Okay. Now the picture here down here on the right is a optical illusion on this idea of, um, of relative size. The orange ball here looks to be bigger than the orange ball here because of what is around it. They're the exact same size. You can do the same thing, put up a pencil or something, try to find something that you can compare the, the measure to and see how big they are. Um, that's, that, that's relative size, okay? Uh, it's like when you're watching a basketball game and you're seeing all the basketball players run around and do their stuff and you're just like, oh, these are, you know, just people. And then after the game, they go and do interviews with like normal sized people and they're all six, eight giants. And so you're just like, whoa, that is super, you can really tell like, wow, this person is massive. But around all of the other basketball players, looks fairly normal. Okay, so next is relative clarity. This one's fairly simple. You can see all of this stuff in the foreground is much more clear. You can see a lot more detail than the stuff way back here. That stuff is really far away, so it's not very clear. You see some colors, but you don't see a lot of fine detail. You see some really fine detail here. You see a little bit of fine detail here and not a lot of fine detail there. There you go. Relative clarity. Easy peasy. Things that are, oh, once again, things that are closer will have more uh, texture and, you know, you'll be able to see more of it. Uh, and then everything that's farther away looks more coarse. There you go. All right. Relative motion. Um, one of the things that uh, works with relative motion is if you uh, blow this um, this picture up on the or here let me I'll explain that in a second. So relative motion is this idea is as we move um, objects that are close will move very fast. Objects that are far away will move very slow. So when you see a plane fly overhead, they're going really really fast. But when you see a plane fly through the sky, it's going really or it looks to be going really, really slow, but we know they're going hundreds of miles an hour. They're, you know, they're cruising, 
okay? Um, when you look down at the sidewalk while you're driving, it looks like it's going really fast. All the things that are right next to you fly by really fast, but things that are far away, they don't really seem like seem to move um, all that quickly, okay? So this picture here is an illusion or is an optical illusion based on relative motion, okay? You can see how um, you just look at different spots. When you look at the spot, like look at the specific circle, okay? When you look at one of these, these circles or whatever, um, this stops moving, but everything in the periphery starts moving. And that's just playing on your sense of relative motion. Okay, next is interposition. This one is just incredibly simple. Okay, how do you know that the mother dog here is farther away than the baby dogs? Okay, one of the ways that you can tell that is that the baby dogs are b literally blocking the view of the mother dog. You can't see all of the mother dog, so you know that must they mean that it's farther away. That's interposition. If something is partially blocking the view of something else, it must be closer. There you go. You can see that with one eye. Next, we have linear perspective. Okay, so with linear perspective, um, basically parallel lines appear to meet in the distance, the farther away it goes. This is just another way that you can tell that some, some things are really far away. This looks really wide and as, or the bottom part looks really, really wide. And as it gets further along, it gets much, much smaller. Okay, great lines, Mr. Monk. Okay, so that is linear convergence. Now, what you can do is you can mess with this with a concept known as the Ponzo illusion. Okay, so I am taking this um, uh, this block and I am Control C, Control V. So now I just have a a block that is the exact same size as you can see. Just put it over top, and now I move it up here. Boom. And so the one on top looks bigger than the one on bottom because it, it with when comparison what is behind it, this is just like, okay, the only reason that this is so big is because it must be, or the only thing reason that this looks so big is it must be, you know, enormous based on, you know, what is behind it. And I can even make it a little bit bigger by moving it up a little bit higher. Okay. Um, so there you go. That is uh, the Ponzo illusion and linear perspective. All right, so next we have light and shadow, okay? So shade helps us perceive depth. Um, you know, we're used to having light come from above, so uh, certain types of shade help us see like, oh, okay, the, you know, this, is, this thing has depth, it's not two-dimensional. Um, and also, objects that are dim appear to be farther away. Um, if you go back and look at the old picture with the pelicans and the, um, the buildings, there are even like hills behind those buildings and they just look so dark and gray. And you're trying to think like, wait a minute, those hills wouldn't be so dark and gray. They'd be like green or maybe, you know, gold or, you know, whatever, depending on where you are. Um, they would have some foliage, but they just look dull and gray because not a lot of light is being reflected off of them. And so you can tell, all right, well, that must think that must be something that's really far away. Okay, so we are out of um, depth perception and we literally have just a few more concepts that we just have to crack into, so this won't take too long. Um, I know I'm already going over the time I told you, but you know, just deal with it. All right, so this is what is known as the Phi Phenomenon. Uh, basically, if you watch any sort of cartoon or anime or any sort of animation show, this is what they use, the Phi Phenomenon. So if you're watching an anime and there's a, uh, a thing where the guy like swings and punches somebody, okay? Are they drawing, when they draw, do they draw literally every single frame as that person goes in to punch? No. They draw it back here, then they draw it here, then they draw it here, and the follow through, and they just play it quickly so that it makes it look like there is some type of motion. And that is from the Phi Phenomenon. It's an illusion of movement where you have two or more adjacent lights blink on and off in quick succession, just like you see here, and it creates the idea of movement. It looks like this little yellow ball is running along this track. It's not, just lights are blipping on and off. But because of the Phi phenomenon, we put, um, you know, we think that there's some sort of movement happening. No movement. Okay, so visual capture. Um, if you get a chance, you should go look up the McGurk effect. 
the McGurk effect is kind of uh, talking about this um, idea of uh, visual capture. And I'm trying to remember how to spell it. M G M C G U R K, the McGurk. M C G U R K, the McGurk effect. And basically, uh, just go watch that. It's hilarious. And it's about what visual capture is. Uh, visual capture is this idea that our eyes are the most dominant sense. We rely on them way more than we rely on any of other our other senses. Um, you know, we rely on them to hear. You know, we rely on them once we hear somebody in our distance to go find them. Uh, we rely on them when we're eating food. Like, does this look good? Uh, and so sometimes our eyes can overlap our other senses. And if you go watch that McGurk video. Um, I'll, uh, I'll post it in the, uh, in the uh, uh, about section. Um, it's great. And it looks at like how are literally the things that we hear can override, or excuse me, the things that we see can override what we legitimately hear, what is actually being said. So uh, give it a chance. It's uh, worth your time. Okay. So uh, perceptual constancy, uh, basically all this is saying is that, uh, Objects that we have a lot of knowledge about um, will stay very, basically the same even as the surroundings change. Uh, so this picture, like this door, even though this, um, we know that this is like a rectangle, we know that this door is a rectangle. Eas even as it moves and kind of changes shape, um, it still looks rectangular to us and that like never really goes away. If you uh, pick up an orange and you look at it in darkness, it still seems very bright to us, even though it is not reflecting all of that information and our cones aren't really picking it up. Our brain is like, we know what an orange is, that thing's supposed to be bright. Same thing with like tennis balls. So certain things that we know a lot about or have seen a lot of will, won't change what they look like even when the the air the, the things that are around them changes like light illumination or shape stuff like that all right last thing is perceptual adaptation um, basically what this says is that even if we change our visual field like our uh, like let's the example once again i'll post another video uh, basically the this kid's wearing these goggles that flip the world world upside down and if you lived like that for a period of time you could live a normal life you could live a life with things flipped over your brain gets used to dealing with different visual fields and hel helps you try to figure out what uh, you know how to cope in that situation and it just works it just does its thing so um once again i got two videos for you that are attached to these they're just fun kind of watch but otherwise thanks a lot for uh sticking with us and y'all have a great day see you later